Hey everybody, are you serious about discipling your children? I've got a really cool interview for you today with Dr. Matt Friedman, the author of Discipleship in the Home, and uh, let me set this up for you. So a couple of years ago, I was taking a seminary class called Discipleship and Spiritual Formation at Wesley Biblical Seminary, and Dr. Friedman was the instructor for that course. In the process, one of the books he had us read was his own book, Discipleship in the Home. It was so practical and so helpful that I went, I literally went and took and read it with my wife again. We were taking a trip a few, a little while later, and I said, babe, I want you to read this book to me while I drive and let's discuss it. And so we did. We had that conversation and we were so impacted by the ideas in the book about how to be intentional about discipling your children that we decided we needed to make some changes in the way that we uh, accomplish that in our family. I've got seven kids. Dr. Friedman has six. His kids are all grown. Mine, uh, the youngest, is currently five years old. So we made some decision. We've got to some 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 changes we've got to make to grow our capacity to become more intentional at discipling. I had learned many things from my parents who were uh, spectacular, affirming parents um, and had copied many of the things that they taught me to do. But I found a new window in which I can gain and grow my ability to disciple children. And so I said, I've got to make sure that this happens. Let's do it. And we did. Recently, I got with Dr. Friedman and said, Dr. Friedman, I would love to, uh, to have an interview with you and share it with the people in my blog and some of the things that I've learned in trying to apply your uh, system of discipleship for your kids. So that, uh, that whole process we're going to discuss, we're going to talk through that and share some of those, re- those uh, resources with you. And I think you're going to glean a lot of wisdom from Dr. Friedman's conversation, my conversation with Dr. Friedman today. So without any further ado, here we go. Hey, welcome everybody. Good to have you here. We're with Dr. Matt Friedman. I am super excited to share this interview because it is so foundational to some of the most important things that you'll ever do in all of your life. There isn't anything more important with the, that you will accomplish in your life than raising kids that love Jesus. Uh, It's some of the most eternal work, some of the most valuable work, some of the most lasting work you're ever going to do in all of your life. You Mm -hmm. could accomplish a ton of things professionally, and if you fail there, you've dropped the ball on one of the most valuable things that Jesus ever entrusted to you. So today we're here with Dr. Mm -hmm. Matt Friedman, who cares deeply about not just raising kids that graduate from high school, uh, not just raising kids that can be successful professionally, but raising children to love and serve Jesus, discipling children, not just raising them, but discipling them. And so he's written a book called Discipleship in the Home, which is fantastic. You ought to read it. Uh, go on uh, Amazon. It's there. You can order it. Uh, you can get it Kindle. You can also get a free audiobook. we'll talk about later. But I want to mm. basically uh, just walk through with him some of what he's learned about discipling children over the years. And uh, Dr. Freeman, thanks for being on with me today. I really appreciate it. An honor to be here with you, Daryl. Thanks for all that you're doing. Well, it's a joy uh, to do it. I've got seven kids, um, and mm. they are they range from my oldest one just went to college. She's 19, um, and my youngest one is five. And so I've got a uh, that kind of that span. Can you tell me about your family and and uh, what you've uh, how you've raised them and what how what ages they are? Are they all grown now? Or yeah, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm sorry to be the uh, the the slacker in this conversation. I only have six kids. Uh, <laughs> I'm ahead. Woo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hate when people win uh, over my my number. Anyway, so uh, we really rejoice in that. Actually, we we love. We think big families are fun and good. And uh, I think if you can parent, you ought to parent, and you ought to parent as much as you can. So there you go. And uh, I think I think uh, almost assuredly. Uh, you're you're that kind of parent, but I'm I'm saying, we uh we met uh you know years ago. I think we're like 38th wedding anniversary now. Um, our children range from age 33 down to um, age I guess 21 now, uh, and the last one's in college, uh, in his final year. So that's kind of our age range. We have five boys and a girl, so we kind of are very grateful for the girl. We specialized in boys, I guess, and. Uh, <laughs> 
really enjoyed really enjoyed all of that very so, cool yeah i've got one uh, girl who's 19 and then the rest are all boys i have six boys in a row so apparently i've forgotten how to do anything else uh but uh, it's uh it's I'm, I'm with you i'm with you there um i hope somebody out there is having girls because my boy's got to get married someday so i'm just hoping that that's what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah. right. well the first <clears throat> first first time around when, when we start talking about kinds of kids we'd like to have I, I we prayed for boy i prayed for boys i wanted boys and the reason though wasn't any kind of hey i just you know i dig testosterone or anything i just thought you know it's really a, a great thing to have uh men out there for women who are looking for godly men and i think there are a lot more godly women than there are godly wow. men so lord give me the guys i'm getting ready to go there for the go. women so there you go. Fantastic. that's that's kind of how we that's kind of how we viewed it uh, initially. Um, but you know, you're always up for whatever Jesus wants you to have. And, yeah. and so we we're glad. For Absolutely. So your kids are grown now. They are, they're all serving the Lord. They are, uh, walking with Jesus. Yeah. They're in ministry, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, we kind of view it as even if you're not in full-time ministry, you're in ministry. That's yeah. kind of always the way we perceive it anyway. So everybody's a full-time minister in that regard. Well, we got, um, one has his own business. Uh, one is a school teacher. Uh, one is a, a PhD in New Testament and is teaching at a Christian university. Uh, we got a vice president here at the seminary where I serve, uh, who is also a church planter. Um, we got a music minister, worship leader in a church in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And again, we got one still coming through school, but it looks like he's going to be a pastor. Fantastic. As well, so. Wow. So I'm I'm super into those results. Like that's that's where. Mm -hmm. 20 years from now, that's, that's where I aspire to be. Um, and yeah, and good, so good. that's why, that's why I'm excited about this is because I, I don't just care that I get through this and that I survive. Um, I, I care that, that there's a certain result that comes out of this. And so my, my goal and my passion for this is, okay, how can I do that? Now, in all honesty, I read your book, Discipleship in the Home. Um, and, <laughs> kind of late in this process in some ways, right? So my oldest, when I read it, my oldest was 18 um, and my youngest was four. And I, I read this book and I was like, oh, this is, this is marvelous. I'm, I'm, I can really up my game here. Um, I read it. Actually, I was in a, a class, a seminary class with you called Discipleship and Spiritual Formation at Wesley Biblical Seminary, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great school, by the way. Um, but I was uh, taking, taking online classes, pastoring full time. And I read this and I was like, oh, I can really up my game. I can do better here. So I went back and read it with my wife um, and tried to recruit her and, and get started on 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 really upping our game we had done some things you know and we've done our best to parent as well as we can but i realized oh i'm missing out on some some ways in which i can turn this up to 10. um and so can you can you tell me how did it start with you one of the things for me is i was like i, I there's a there's a chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago but the second best time right. is today um, and yeah, so right. that's kind of the way I've tried to view this, this thing. Okay. So there are some things that I wish I had done differently or better, uh, 10 years ago, but I might as well start right. now, um, in, in raising my, raising the bar and upping my game. So how did that work for you guys? When did you start getting super intentional about discipleship? Can you tell me that story? Yeah. So, uh, our, our, yeah, I can tell you almost to the month of the first child. So, uh, and, and there's a reason for that. I, I, I was teaching at Wesley Biblical Seminary. I, you know, I, I've been here now for, I'm in my 36th year. So I would, you know, I started when I was 10, I guess. But, you know, I, we were very young at the time and, and, uh, and, but we just had a kid. And so, uh, you know, he's 17 months old. I, uh, I go to school and I teach and there's a, a there's a footnote in a Dobson uh, a book that had this study that said, if you don't do these things by the age of 18 months, doors slam shut, windows shut for your kid's brain. I mean, there are some irretrievable things that have to happen in those first month and a half. And I thought, whoa, what I want. So anyway, it's a list of about five or six things. So I go home that night, I said, sweetheart, uh, Dobson's got this really interesting list of what has to happen for your kid by 18 months. Let me read it to you. She goes, don't want to hear it. I said, well, 
hey, you don't want to hear it. Wait, of course you want to hear it. No, no, she goes, I don't. And it took me a while to figure out, ah, 18 months, 17 months, she's a perfectionist and she is a dutiful mother and does everything right and had pretty much done everything right with that list. But she didn't want to hear it that maybe she had missed out on something. So I'm, I'm not a, the most sensitive husband. I'll just go ahead and tell, <laughs> say that straight up. But insensitivity uh, sensitivity uh, washed over me in that moment. So I just shut up, uh, which is kind of unusual. <laughs> I, I thought something went wrong here. What went wrong? And then it dawned on me 17 months, 18 months. I thought, huh? But in that moment, uh, I said, probably about 45 minutes later, I said, hey, let's do this. Why don't you get a piece of paper? I'll get a piece of paper. And we'll put down what we'd like Caleb, and that was our firstborn, what we'd like for him to be like when he is age 18, when he'll leave this house and uh, pretty much be out from under us. She goes, okay. And so she made a list. I made a list. Uh, the next morning, we put that list together. We categorized the things that we'd put down. And that became for us an age 18 list mm. of the things we wanted him to be like. Now, it's not, you got to be careful. And we were, we were, we were. You know, I was a second string quarterback. I want my son to be the first string quarterback and get a scholarship to the University of Kansas. No, 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 not 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 that right. kind of stuff. Stuff like, would we like for him to know Latin? Uh, would we like for him to pray to receive Jesus? Would we like for him to um, to know how to handle money? Do we want him to be a virgin? Uh, these kinds of things that we thought, you know, it's kind of controllable things, right. uh, things that are measurable, things are behavioral. And so it became for us an age 18 list. And we revived it slightly across the years, but pretty much that list that we have that was the controlling thing for all six kids was made on the second day we asked the question, what do we want them to be like? Well, that's a plan. And, and, and the whole important thing about a plan here, Daryl, is the world has a plan for your kid. Yeah. The right. world does. Satan has a plan for your kid. They, they know what they want that kid to be like at right. age 18, and they intend. Madison Avenue, Hollywood, intends to make that kid and because it's good for them. It makes right. them more money. It makes them, you know, it's, it's life up for them. So they intended a public school system. Even the private school system has a plan for your kid. I just want to make sure that whatever plan is going on for my children, it's something given by God to me yeah. for them instead of you know some other controlling influence because god didn't say i want the public school to form your kid he really didn't even say i want the private school mm -hmm. to form the kid he said mom and dad it's your yeah. ball game this is something i want you to do and again i have a dear friend that says um that everyone is getting discipled everybody whether yeah. you're christian not christian whether you're pagan, it doesn't matter. Everyone is getting discipled. It's just by who and by what. So I want to make sure that I've got the plan to do it well and for Jesus and for Absolutely. his Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So so you kind of start with you. Stephen Covey says begin with the end in mind, right? So you kind of start with, yeah. a, with a picture and it's almost like it serves like the puzzle box, right? So the top, you, it, when first thing you do when you open a, a 500 piece, puzzle, right, you set the yeah. box lid up over here. I hate puzzles, but yeah, yeah, you lost, you almost lost me on that. But I, I'm. Back I don't with like you now. puzzles either. But my wife and my dad love them. So every Christmas, like one five hundred or thousand piece breaks out on the table, and uh, the two or yeah. three people who are uh, that kind of person uh, work on it throughout the the holiday. But so the first thing you do is you don't throw the top away. You set it up because you want to see where the yeah. individual pieces fit, and it's easiest if you have a pattern. Um, so yeah, Good. yeah. Thinking that through ahead of time. Beautiful, beautiful. So you had this picture in what you were trying to produce and you can kind of reverse engineer that and say, okay, here are the steps that are going to get us from here toward there. So give me, give me that, that li a little bit there. Tell me some of the stuff that your kids have done and have memorized over the course of time. Kind of paint that picture for me. Um, okay. Well, yeah. So part of the plan, well, before yeah, we sure. get to that, the age 18 list is okay. You probably ought to have two columns. One would be what you want him to be, her to be, and what is what you need to be in order to make oh, that yeah, happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, wow. So take take a, a little simple thing here. Um, we wanted our children to uh, play a musical instrument. Anyone, I don't, just you know, music's important to us. We like right. singing. We think it's important to be able to participate in music across your life. 
it's a it may be a silly little thing, but I think it's actually sure, pretty yeah. important. And Mary's a singer, I'm a singer, we both play instruments. So that's kind of well, okay, so what do we need to do to make that happen? And that that becomes important because you just can't hope that it's going to happen mm. someday. Yeah. If you think it's important for the kid, then you gotta kinda help make it mm. happen. So all our kids love music and all our kids you know, play an instrument, but that's the thing. You've got to decide what you want to make happen there. Now, one of the things on our age 18 list is we wanted them to know a biblical theology, a good sound doctrine. And we wanted them to know many scriptural verses. We didn't actually put a number in. Uh, I had no idea. Oh, well, anyway, a number in, we wanted them to know. So that's important. What's interesting is some of these things kind of wake you up somewhere along the line. For instance, at age eight, my, that son, Caleb, uh, who, by the way, is, is, is a brilliant guy now writing very uh, writing books that I can't read. I mean, that, that's the kind of yeah. brilliant he is. I mean, so he, he's doing things well beyond dad. Uh, but when he was age eight, I asked him, son, how many persons are there in the Trinity? And he had no clue what I was talking about. I thought I could blame the church for that but it's really wow, mom and yeah. dad's fault mm -hmm. here. So I went home and I wrote a catechism and uh, it has 120 some quite 25, 27, 28 question. And it's just quick, uh, quick question, quick yeah. answer. So how many gods are there? There's only one God. How many persons are there in that one God? Three, the father, the son, the Holy spirit. And so we had these questions right. and we, and we had those questions literally 48 hours after i asked him that question he didn't have an answer i thought this is my fault i went to my office made up this catechism and we had it published in a short period wow. of time yeah. thousands of these things out there now in the world uh being used with by parents but it was just a very simple thing and the whole point there was uh if you memorize that and by the way your kid uh, or we've had kids who had it that had it memorized in our in our family by age of you know three and four mm -hmm. it just because these things were always wafting through their brains at dinner time. We did, always did ours at dinner time. And so they just kind of knew, you know, it was always around them. They didn't know a time when they didn't know the nice. catechism. But, and, so, and so some of that stuff is really good. And, and uh, you put in that catechism what you'd like. We, we already have one, so you don't have to make it up from scratch. And by the way, that is in the, the book we have, the new book we have called The New Discipleship in the Home. Yeah. So having said all that, we said, okay, are there hymns we want them to sing? Are there verses we want them to memorize? And I tell you what, they can learn stuff fast if you start young enough. And I know that because Jesus probably at a very young age had the Torah memorized if he was like anything else that was going around him. And so kids by their adolescence knew the Torah word for word. That about Torah, yeah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They didn't know the stories. No, they knew it word for word. Yeah, they knew the stories because they knew the stories word yeah. for word. Levitic, they knew Leviticus word for word. I mean, that's the kind of thing. So can they memorize things? Oh my, the, the, the younger you start, the more they can memorize, the faster you train their brains to memorize. And so our family, I, I will say very disappointingly, only has about 500 verses together memorized. But when I, once I saw how good they were, I thought, man, I'm embarrassed. So I started asking other families, you know, hey, hey my family's got 500 verses memorized, pal. How did, and some, you know, most people say, well, we don't have anything memorized. But some, I start hearing some other answers like, oh, well, yeah, we got the Sermon on the Mount memorized, Galatians memorized, Ephesians memorized. We got Revelation memorized. That took a little time. <laughs> You're thinking, are you kidding me? They weren't oh, kidding. Wow. It's really achievable if you start yeah. young, do it word by word. Don't add much every day. Just add a little bit every day. But every day across the year is you've got some stuff. Yeah, memorized. yeah. So it's just amazing. But I think that memorization piece is huge because Dallas Willard says that is the key for him. For him, the key to spiritual formation is scripture memory. Well, I think scripture memory, him memory, creeds memory, other things memory too. But I think memory is a big thing. And you can say, well, I'm not very good at it. Well, I'm, I don't think I'm very good at it, but a three-year-old kid's pretty yeah. good at it, I can tell you right now. Absolutely, yeah. So, so the science of, or the the way in which that that uh, education has kind of moved away from that in some ways and moved away from rote memorization, but it is unbelievable. So, like something's going to fill that gap, right? They're either going to know yep. every line of SpongeBob SquarePants or they're going to know the scripture. That's and what you I'm, take your and you get see, to design it. 
That's just incredible. Idea. Yeah. And we have moved away from memorization. They don't do it as well as yeah. they used to. But if you exercise that muscle, they will do yeah. it. And uh, it'll be they'll be quite good at it. And uh, and you're right. The uh, the gap gets yeah. filled. Uh, you know, I, I I can tell you, bye bye, Miss American Pie. I know that song from my youth. <laughs> I have no idea what it means, but I can tell you there it is. And how is that? That song makes no sense. But I can tell you, I can I can sing it to you right now. And I, I can sing you a thousand other songs of my youth, too. So memories yeah. memory was happening. Uh, if it's happening with, uh, you know, the Billy Joel songs, should it be happening instead with the word of God? And I'm thinking, yeah, probably yeah, the word of God. Definitely. Definitely. So everything in life is a trade-off. Um, hmm. so if you're going to, if you're going to not, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to not do this, right? There's, it's not, it's not possible to do all of it. Uh, so some people have, these kind of goals for their kid, or they don't have any goals for the, they, have, they have no goals. And so into that vacuum rushes the discipling forces of the culture uh, through uh, a variety of, of doors. Some of the yeah. doors that, that we, we have more doors than ever available these days. Um, and so talk to me, you have an entire book in your uh, entire chapter in your book on technology. Now I'm going to just quickly share my screen here and say, this is uh, this is where you can, like I said, you can get the book "Discipleship in the Home: The New Discipleship in the Home" by Matt Friedman on um, on Amazon, or uh, you can get it. Uh, you can also get a. I'll share a link at the end where you can get a, an audio book of it as well. Uh, but I would definitely encourage you to get a hold of the book so that you have you can share it, you can talk through it with your wife, you can uh, be try to be intentional about that whole process. You have an entire chapter on. The relationship of the family and the children to technology, and I actually share um, your. You you may find yourself somewhat alone in that from time to time because it seems like everybody's like, oh, let's give the child every device that exists and uh, plant them in front of the screen in order to babysit them. What we don't realize is that they are being babysit, but they're also being discipled uh, in in sometimes really subtle ways. Talk to me about your your position on your position on uh, technology and how the family and children should relate to that. Well, so one of the parts of the book, I'm, I'm looking right now um, because I do have a book here. Uh, I'm looking right now, page 30, uh, 52 and 53, in which we roll out the quotes by the guys that made the technology. <laughs> yes. Listen, you think, you know, the Apple guys must have iPhones in every kid's hand um, from age two. No, Apple CEO Tim Cook says, you know, I don't have a kid, but I have a nephew. And I put boundaries on that nephew. There's some things I won't allow and I won't let them on a social network, period. You know, here's a Facebook senior executive. There's no screen time whatsoever for my children. <laughs> and Steve Jobs says, bad idea. Screens are a bad idea for your kids. It wouldn't let his kid around us. You know, if Steve Jobs and uh, Tim Cook and, you know, Facebook guys, Reddit co-founders, uh, we had the Napster founder and, and, and former Facebook president. If all these people, what do they know we don't yeah. know? And that is, yep, we create these devices in order that they might be addictive, in order that you might make us lots of money. Yeah. But they know they're not good for kids and they're not good for themselves. And, and so they're not huge. So the whole point here is I just figured out when I was, listen, I love TV. I mean, I'm going to tell you straight up. I love TV. I love the bad stuff, the good stuff, the immoral stuff, the morals, whatever. If it's on a screen, I You're love it. Your, your brain is captivated by it. I'm yeah. just telling you. And they made it that way. And most of us are. I grew up in a home where the TV was on. If there was a human being in the house, the TV was yeah. on. So that's just kind of my, that, that, that's the world I grew out of. But somewhere in college, it dawned on me, this is not good. And I went into my house, grabbed my TV and threw it out. And we've never had one hmm. since, not because I'm a prude. I just have learned what it does to the brain. And I've learned that it's a discipleship program hmm. yeah. that Hollywood wants to foist on. Madison Avenue wants to foist on me and on my family. And then I later learned what TV actually does to the brain, whether it's good TV or bad TV. Now, some people say, oh, right. 
and I do, I still watch some things. I don't mind that my kids watch some things on a very uh, not regular pattern. I mean, let's not do this every week. Let's do this maybe once a month. Let's watch something fun. But I don't want their brains to get trained on it because we know what it does yeah, to the yeah. brain. It actually changes the way the brain right. works. If that's the case, then I want to say then no. And so we were able for the most part to say no TV in the house. Uh, we're not going to make a steady diet of, of watching it. Uh, no one had their own computer. No one had their own iPhone. No one. Now, when they went to college, we said uh, age 18, right? So I want to control this program from, from zero to 18. Age 18, if you would like to have uh, uh, an iPhone or a phone at that point, uh, you may buy one with your own money. If you want a computer, and we kind of recommend you have one in college, you need to buy it yourself. So they knew that was coming. So that, that kind of made the money play in as well. So you need to save up for this because there's time coming where you're going to want a car, you're going to want a computer, you're going to want a phone, and mom and dad's not paying for it. We want you to save up for it and make that on your own purchase. And so all that happened. And I think for the betterment of my kids, because their brains weren't trained on Hollywood, their brains weren't trained on Madison Avenue, and their brains weren't, tra uh, weren't trained on um, a, a medium that changes the way your brain works. Now, this data is in the book, so I won't go into it now. I'm just telling you. Uh, Everybody uses that. Listen, we don't have one TV in the house. Most people have. Uh, I, I was actually in a seminar in Madison, Mississippi, where a guy had 27 TVs in his house. <laughs> 27. 27. That, 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 that's more than one per room. I mean, 27 TVs in the house. He had a big house. I'm sure he lived right. in a mansion. He's yeah. a wealthy guy. I'm thinking, really? So he was very proud. He, he reported back to me. We got rid of half of them. I'm thinking, well, great. <laughs> still, it's still not good for your brain. Uh, and so I would just say, I would really put yourself on a major league diet when we're talking about TV. And if I get rid of the TV and I would get rid of the iPhone for your kids, you say, I was in Memphis one day. Okay, Daryl, you ready for a yeah, story? I was in Memphis one day. It was early in the morning, 5.45 a.m. I'm giving a thing on discipleship in the home. And 250 people, 5.45 a.m., 250 people in front of me. And uh, so I'm giving them this, this stick. And you can tell they're not buying it. No one buys it, Daryl. No one wants to do this. No TV. What planet are you living on? Well, I want to live on planet Jesus. I want to live on the planet kingdom, you know. I want it on the planet, maximize your brain, and TV doesn't do it for you on, on any right. of those fronts. Anyway, so I came up to me after he said, can I buy you breakfast? Yeah, let's, let's go out for breakfast. He says, man, and he had, he had an iPhone in his hand. He said, uh, he said, Matt, he said, uh, I got a problem. So what's your problem? He said, uh, my kid. Man, they can get everything now on this little phone. I said, I know. They, they watch movies. They can watch TV. They can watch the news. They can get everything on these TVs now. I said, I know. He said, what am I going to do? So what do you mean what are you going to do? I said, who pays for that phone? He says, well, I do. He says, well, I think that means you're in control. So what I would do is I'd have a nice, sweet, gentle talk full of facts and full of Facebook inventor quotes. And uh, I'd take that phone away from him. He said, you would? I said, well, I have. I said, and he said, but what happened? I love this. So he thought he's going any place he could possibly go in his brain to find a reason why my kid still needs. So well, 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 what happens if he's in, in trouble sometime? I said, stop it. First of all, you and I were raised our whole lives with all kinds of things the way you ain't here today and we're here we didn't have phones growing up you and i and somehow we made it through the rain but i said but let me say this if in fact he has a problem he's in trouble he is out there and he needs help you know what he's going to do I said what's he going to do he says he's going to look over to his buddy ben and say ben let me use your phone <laughs> it's, it's true <laughs> and you know what he did you started crying. Now I'm not saying he's boo hoo and bad tears in his eyes. And he just said, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I've got the funny feeling. Most of us feel like we have to do what we're doing as far as the world is concerned because everybody else is doing yeah. it. 
We don't have to do what everybody else does. Look, one of the one of the definitions of holy is different, mm -hmm. and we're called to be different. I don't think we're called to be weird or, or, or crazy, but but different. And by the way, let me redeem the word crazy. I'll look that word up one day in a big old fat dictionary. You ever, you ever seen one of the big Ridiculous. old fat dictionaries in the library? We got the word crazy. The eighth definition, I had 17 definitions of crazy. Eighth definition was significant deviation from the norm. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want to be. I, I want my family to significantly deviate from the norm of American, of Western culture. Yeah. And we want, and then for me, that means crazy equals holy. Yeah. So one of the other definitions of holy is is this idea of whole and like it connects to the, it connects yeah. to this idea of completeness or thoroughness or uh fullness if you will and so right the 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 craziness or the differentness ties in with a wholeness and if we don't if we're not willing to be a little different we don't get whole okay but i love this um and i, I wrote a book just recently with a couple other guys and uh and the, the last chapter, uh, the, the, the major author, the guy that, you know, why we're the rest of us are in the project said, all right, let me take one last whack at this, you know, and, and, and he says, it is this kind of lifestyle it is a whole different topic. So I'm not going to tell you, but the, this takes sacrifice. And I, I, I said, no, let's not, let's not do that. That this life takes, I said, I don't doubt that it's true, but the fact of the matter is this is the abundant yeah. life. Right. You know, the things I put down in this book, this isn't the bad way to live. This is the great yeah, way to yeah. live. And you're going to find your life happier. Your kids are going to end up in a lot better place in life. You're going to have grandkids like you would never imagined you could have. Grand I mean, your life is going to be extraordinary if you live. This isn't a life of sacrifice, a life of weirdness, a life of crazy. This is the abundant sure. life. Yep. This is the way life ought to be lived. And you're going to be so much happier and well adjusted in this life than just about everybody around you. there's a wholeness to holiness uh there's a, a wellness mm -hmm. to it uh to to being willing to be different and uh so yeah thank you for that that's that's beautiful so you you uh you have book you have chapters in the book i'm not going to go into all these but you have chapters uh in the book on uh discipline uh the combination of love and discipline how do you how do you yeah. uh to manage that tension you have uh uh, a great chapter on words, the power of words in discipleship, conversation and reading um, and those kinds of things. Um, I, I, you, folks, you got to get this book. OK, it's uh, it's it's really, really genuinely helpful. In fact, you actually have lists of resources as well, not just that you, you have chapters that teach the concepts and you have like list of resources where like, here's the things that we read to our kids. Here's the conversations you need to have with your kids. And so not only is it conceptually valuable, but it is incredibly practical where it's you you put handles uh, on this thing. This, it, there's places to grab hold of. And uh, so it's one of the things I appreciate about the book and one of the reasons i went back and read it with my wife so uh hey dads if you are here and you're listening to this you're watching this uh you take one of the ways you can take leadership is by educating yourself and then inviting your wife to educate with you all right so read the book and then go back and say hey babe i've really been thinking about this discipling our kids read this book i'd really like you to read it with me and read one chapter every night before bed or over lunch or whatever in the morning whatever is your it fits with your schedule take leadership in that kind of way in your family. My wife and I uh, read it on a trip. She read it to me while I drove. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the way, uh, that's the way you can, a practical way you can move forward. And this book is incredibly, incredibly practical. So uh, Dr. Freeman, what um, I'm, I'm going to pull over here. Can you look at my questions that I had? I've got a second screen because I have two uh, screens here. So I'm looking away, but what, um, what, did, what did you, what did your kids memorize over time? So you mentioned 500, like 500 verses of, of scripture, uh, which by the way, is better than 50. Um, it's like an, another zero, right? Uh, so uh, it's not just John three sixteen and, uh, and that sort of thing. It's you, you've memorized significant passages of scripture. Um, what, what, give me an overview of the content that your kids knew by the time they graduated from high school. No, oh, well, I mean, thirty question catechism. Uh, I don't know how many, yeah, I don't know how many hymns we used, uh, uh, you know, the contemporary churches, which we tended to go to and, and be a part of, weren't teaching the hymns. So I thought, well, 
you know, I got mad at the church. We're not teaching our kids. I'm like, who's supposed to teach them hymns? The church or me? So about everybody a hymn book. Let's all let's all get out the hymns. So they know the hymns, you know, all the all the old hymns. I love it that they know hymns that older people don't know, you know. Nice. I mean? So yeah. they know the fun hymns, the the, the hymns have it sort of a cultural literacy of hymns, but then they know some Wesleyan hymns, some booth hymns that you know you don't generally know. To, to their credit, thank the Lord. Then, then with about 500 verses of scripture, and we put the in the book, we put some of the starter verses in there. And I don't know how many verses there are here, but it looks to be like about uh, 100 starter uh, verses you could do. Then we just started, hey, you know, when I was in seminary, I, I memorized the Sermon on the Mount. Let's memorize the Sermon on the Mount. So we memorized the Sermon on the Mount. So about 500 verses. Then I thought, you know, Creeds are kind of important in Christian history. Let's learn the Apostles' Creed. Let's learn the Nicene Creed. Uh, one day I got irritated because uh, the pastor seemed to be confused on the Trinity. So I went home and said, you know, uh, and I, I really, I was, I was mad. So I foisted this one on my kids in anger. But I said, let's memorize the Athanasian Ooh, yeah. Creed. Now, I don't know if you know the Athanasian <laughs> Creed, Daryl, but, you know, this is the Apostles' Creed. Nice little, nice little sweet thing. This is the Nicene Creed. Uh, not so sweet anymore. This is the yeah, it's like four pages or something. Yeah. <laughs> and if you ever wanted to, uh, to you know, irritate the kids, you said, okay, let's do the Athanasian Creed. And they all go, Ooh. but they don't knew it. And uh, it helped them, by the way. They get in exams. Uh, one time, uh, someone walked up to uh, Caleb on the university campus and says, uh, it was, you can tell it was a class project. Hey, what do you think about the Trinity? Or, uh, hey, Describe the Trinity, and he went into the Athanasian Creed, and the, finally the interviewer kind of walked, slinked away while he was still doing the Athanasian Creed, which takes you about seven or eight minutes to get through just speaking <laughs> it out. I mean, so it was kind of funny. So it, it can help you in school. The catechism can help you sure. later on in school. Um, so they know that. They know the creeds. Uh, there's some important things out of John Wesley I wanted them to know. Uh, I want them to be activists, yeah. uh, particularly to the point of pain in their community. So there was some uh, some really good William Booth quotes I wanted them to know, some really good John Wesley quotes. There's some important prayers I wanted them to know. And so uh, we 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 had about uh, probably six, seven, eight prayers. Some of them right out of the Bible, Lord's Prayer, for instance, but some of them not right out of the Bible. Some of them were from St. Francis and, and, and other prayers like that. So sure, had a lot yeah. of things that we just put. And if I had it do all over again, might choose a little differently. But on the whole, I think we kind of nailed it. Um, and when you look back over your life, you think, would I do some things differently? And the, the fact of the matter is yes. But this, and let me get, tell you about this episode. When Caleb left, and I talk about Caleb Lockett, but he's a firstborn. He went through the whole program. When Caleb left, um, it I, for me, it was the beginning of the end. And I love parenting. I just love this. I love doing this. I mean, I just love doing it. And when they left, it just, I thought, this is the beginning of the end. So it was a, it, all the rest of the kids, I didn't like them leaving either, but it just killed me. I was in a fetal position in bed for about eight months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, oh, oh, I can't believe it's it's ending. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, my wife finally, you know, let, let's talk about this. And I said, I just don't think I've been a good parent. You know, I just, I was, I went into sort of the depression mode thing. And she said, would you please stop it? And she she marched through everything we done. We planned on these things at age eighteen, and he did that and more by the age of eighteen. Yeah, he knows the Bible, he knows the creeds, he knows the prayers. He's a lovely Christian guy. And guess what? You're not allowed it. This all happened because we had a plan, and you know it helped me. It yeah. just helped me. I would hate to get to the age of fifty, look back and think, "Oh my word, I didn't do any of this." By the way, some people do say that. Yeah. And you know what? Because so many people said it, I wrote a parent, uh, I wrote a grandparenting yeah. chapter. I just said, listen, you want to be a great grandparent? Yeah, here's how you can do yeah. that. So I just think it's it's great to have a plan. It's great to be able to look forward and say, we did do some things. If you don't have a plan, you have to know that uh, the devil and all his angels has one Definitely. for him. And so does the world and so does Hollywood. And, and I just don't want their plan to win. Definitely. Wow. Yeah. So I I uh, was I was super inspired when I read this book, and I thought, okay, so I'm going to collect 
uh, I'm going to collect the stuff that that you that you had. You had mentioned all these uh, these prayers. You had mentioned these lists of scriptures. You had all that, and I decided I'm going to collect this and I'm going to start putting it into a notebook because you, when you sit down at your table, you got to have something in front of you, right? You got to have some kind of content. Yeah. You good. guys usually do. Let me before I get get to all that. Let me ask you another question. So you guys usually do. Uh, did your your discipleship time at the table? You actually talk about this significantly in the book. Like, yeah. exactly, here's how we do that. Um, give give me a little a thumbnail sketch of that. Yeah, well, so um, Marvin Wilson has a great book called Our Father Abraham, and it talks about the Jewish roots of Christianity. And a lot of it is, and by the way, we probably ought to get back to some of those Jewish roots. But one of them was this: when they were fleeing from Jerusalem. In the exile, you know, Jerusalem's been sacked. The temple's gone. We're in trouble. Let's run for our lives. As they're running for their lives, they said, you know, what are we going to do? We don't have synagogues now. They've been all torn down. That don't have a temple now. It's been torn down. Where are we going to worship? Where are we going to do our Jewish thing? And they decided as they're on the run, hmm, how about the home? How about the home be our miniature temple, our miniature synagogue? How about the home be our place of worship? And the dinner table will be our altar. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So the altar will be at the, altar the place the where you meet God. Right. And so, yeah. Yes. And yeah. so, this is where we're going to bless our yeah. kids. This is where we're going to learn the songs of Zion. This is where we're going to uh, make sure that they're memorizing the scripture. This is where we're going to make sure that they understand that we have a destiny. And so I thought, wow, we. We got to start doing that. So I'm a crazy guy here. When I, when I think something's a good idea, I just drag everybody along with me and say, let's start doing it. So, okay, dinner table. So I think like the next day, all right, from now on, this is what we're doing. And so we had a long list of things we did. For instance, we'd start off and say, uh, I think it's important that they know dad's a reader and dad is a read alouder. And so that is my time to read aloud the kids. So I'd read C.S. Lewis to them or I'd read a uh, uh, some Tolkien to them or a mission biography. That was my favorite mission yeah. biographies. So I'd read a little something takes about five minutes. Let me just read something. If it's a half a chapter, fine, a quarter of a chapter, fine. We'll pick up tomorrow. So let me read a little bit. Then let's sing a song together. That's where the hymn book came in. And pretty soon they don't need the hymn books because they know them. And so let's, let's, let's read, let's do a hymn. Let's do a section out of the catechism. Uh, let's do an old Testament passage together. We've memorized together or are memorizing together. Let's do a new Testament passage. Let's do a creed together. Maybe the apostles, maybe one of those famous booth things, maybe one of those famous Wesley things. Uh, let's do a creed together. Then let's do a famous prayer together, either out of the Bible or the St. Augustine prayer or the St. Francis prayer. Then let's pray for a meal. And I think I'm leaving something out, but anyway, I just had this list of stuff. Now, some people say, whoa, that's too much, man. We want to eat. I'm thinking, yeah, I want to eat too. But this became the time where I do, because listen, we were trying to do it in the morning. Wasn't working out in the morning. Too too, too, too broad of a span of, of, of life from yeah. ages. And we weren't really doing it at night because, again, no one. we didn't all go to bed sure. at the same time. Yeah. So I thought, man, when can we do this thing? And this worked perfect because I never miss a meal. So... I, we're gonna we're gonna be there for devotions, right. and by the way, there's research in the book that suggests one of the great things you can do for your kid, devotion or not, is eat with yeah. them. They did a huge survey of National Merit scholars and said, "What is, what is it they have in, in common?" And the answer is nothing. Yeah. They have nothing in common except one thing, that is they eat together as a wow. family. That's the one thing National Merit scholars have. So I'm thinking, if it's good intellectually, Marvin Wilson uh, con has convinced me the Jews did it, the Christians substantially did it, and it's good for their brains, and it ain't working out any other time of the day, and I never miss a meal. Perfect. And there we go. And so we did all those things, and that became the premier time. Now, there's one question that always comes up. I go through this whole program, and I think some, I think somebody comes and says, so what's a fifth creed we could do or something? No, they don't ask a good question like that. The question everybody has is, it always comes from a woman. <laughs> How do you keep the food warm? <laughs> so I thought, apparently that's a thing when you cook, keeping the food warm. So I looked over at my wife, I said, sweetheart, how, how do you keep the food warm? She goes, put a lid on it. 
So I just started saying, you put a lid on. I mean, I don't know. It's, I would think it's a little bit of a minor problem if you're forming people for the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ, the Great Commission, and the fulfillment of the Great Commandments. Put a lid on it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I love it. I love it. So I, I, um, uh, I decided I was going to, to gather this stuff and put it into some kind of format. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, hang on. Let's stop, stop right here. So Daryl thinks, all right, I, I need to outdo this guy. <laughs> and he has, and I tell you, it's beautiful. Thank you for doing it. So that's one of those things. If I had it all to do over again, what would I do? I, I, I go to my friend here and say, Hey, what's the resource you got that does better than my resource? <laughs> That's why I love. We're stepping on each other's shoulders. I would go with what you've combined in this research. I want you to tell about it because it's a really a great. So tool, I took I, think, I took the the appendices of the book, uh, which are lists yeah. primarily lists of resources. Um, if you go to discipleshipinthehome.com, you can get a uh, you can get a a resource. Uh, you can get actually the the audio book. And I'm going to type in discipleshipinthehome.com and share my screen right now. So. If you um, if you go to discipleship in the home, you can get the audio book for free. You just click right here. It kind of gives you a description of what you're getting with the audio book. Uh, you can click that. You can put in your info, and when you do, it will send you to your email uh, a download link where you can download each individual track, each individual chapter, or whatever, um, in your an MP3 format, or you can download the whole uh, the whole thing as a zip file if you're on a laptop. Um, so when you do that. Um, it also gives you opportunity to purchase this. So this is the Discipleship in the Home Resource Notebook. Uh, I'm going to get the glare off of that by opening it up. Um, that uh, that notebook will give you all essentially all of the appendices. The appendices don't translate well to audiobook format because it's just reading a list of resources, uh, which is not super helpful um, in that kind of way, in audiobook format. They're all in the book. I encourage you to buy the book. However, if you want something to create, what I found was after I finished reading the book, I was like, now I got to go get all this stuff, copy and paste it into a document, look up all these scriptures in whatever version, paste it into a document, downloaded all that. So what I did is I wound up creating this. I did it for my own family and for our church because I'm a, I'm a past, full-time pastor as well. So all the prayers that we just talked about are in this book under great prayers of Christian history. All the... Um, all the uh, hymns, there's a there's a list of, I think it's 57 hymns uh, under Great Hymns of Christian History. And let me just show you how this works. Um, if you take that uh, QR code and you scan, there we go. If you scan that QR code, it takes you to a page on my website uh, that has all of the, talks a little bit about singing hymns, has the introduction, and then it has performances of 57 of those hymns. So here's the doxology. Uh, here's Amazing Grace. Here's Before the Throne of God Above. Here's O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Here's Holy. So you can click. You can click that thing and actually oh, yeah, sing along. Yeah. So right. All of these actually, you can. They're all uh, performances that are. I tried to find something with lyrics on the screen, um, and that was singable. Uh, you know, so it's not just some kind of dramatic uh, vocal performance that nobody can do. It's more like singable stuff. So. Uh, those are all, I don't own those. Those are all on YouTube, uh, but uh, they're, and I can't. Well, so let, let, let me say this, though. You didn't just put the stuff I had in there. You you fortified it with a few extra things, too. So I, I mean, did pull in, I did and, pull in a few other things, yeah. And so I just appreciate what you pulled in. So I think that, that's why I say, so if I look back and say, if I had to do all over again, I'd do it with your stuff. <laughs> and, and so. There's a plus the things you added in. I think that's great. I pulled stuff. in a lot. I pulled really in some other things. Stuff. So under great quotes of Christian history, which is where you talked about the William Booth quote, could not call, did you say? And and uh, all of those kind of things. Do all the good you can by John Wesley. All of those kind of things. I also added a yeah, few others stuff. that have been inspirational to our family. That's My King by S.M. Lockridge, the famous uh, passage about Jesus. Uh, that's just marvelous. Um, and then some powerful stuff. Adoniram Judson had an incredible passage. He wrote... Uh, to uh, to his uh, prospective in-laws. He wrote, could you consent to part with your daughter when he was going to invite her to go be with him? Yeah, basically says, hey, we're going to go we're going to go overseas and die. Yeah. Is that, Is that okay all right? You? Can I still marry your daughter? Like that's a that's a hard sell, you know, 
And then there and are things, these problems, by the there way. are things that I, I added in such as uh, these creeds. So I'm going to try to see if I can do this reversed here. Um, so the creeds actually have uh, a video performance um, that adds in to all this. And I'm going to turn off my Bluetooth so that it can be heard, but so it has uh, some music behind it. Creator and of heaven and earth. So there's I a, believe in Jesus. I believe in so you get the idea. Uh, all the, all three of the creeds, Athanasian, Nicene apostles, all of them have a uh, vocal performance and, um, and a, a video that goes along with it. So there's a lot of resources that you can do. So the cool thing is you can plug this and attach this to a Bluetooth speaker and you can run this at your table. Hey kids, we're getting ready to gather. Let's sing come thou fount of every blessing while we're gathering. And so we did that yesterday. Uh, and my kids are, by the way, they're learning music is important to us too. So they're learning four part harmony while I'm doing that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. It's really been awesome to hear my 16 year old son singing bass and my 14 year old singing tenor. And my wife and I are taking the other two, uh, parts. And, uh, so ultimately finding a slot where you can do this sort of thing. If you, if you want to download the, the audio book, you can do it at discipleshipinthehome.com. And incidentally, I'm going to share my screen one more time. You were talking about all of the uh, scripture memory. I created, um, I created something my kids and I did on the way to school this morning. Uh, we actually did Psalm 1, which is uh, another one that's in this playlist. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but... No, there yeah, we go. All stuff. these this things, these stuff. are all part of the, all part of the picture. I got to pause this over here. There we go. Uh, all that part of the picture to make it possible for you to be ready by dinner time tonight. And that's the that's the thing. It, mm. uh, otherwise, if you don't have you like I don't have time to put this all together and cut and paste and all that. It's going to take me a month to be ready. Hey, you want to be ready by tonight? There you go. Uh, you can download that, print this out, and you're three hole punch it and put it in a binder, and you're ready by tonight. Uh, or email it to your local office depot or something and uh, have them print it. So. Um, I, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much for being on with me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, check out the book on Amazon and, uh, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much.